It is often said, common sense is not very common, implying that having good common sense is an intellectual privilege. We also think common sense qualifies as to analyze and comment on anything. When a survey was conducted in Australia on the public perception of climate change, almost one third of the respondents commented that they don't think climate change is happening and they attributed the reason for their conclusion on common sense. It's just common sense, that's what they said. Being a person who has been learning, doing and teaching science, I would say that you need a sense beyond common sense to understand science. I would even argue that common sense is a hurdle for understanding certain things. Let's have a look at the famous experiment of the falling objects, originally done by Galileo Galilei. Take two water bottles. One of them is empty and the other one is filled. If you allow them to fall from rest from the same height, which one of them would hit the ground at first? Just think about it. If you remember your school lessons, you would say that both of them would hit the ground at the same time. But just introspect and ask your common sense what it says to you about the outcome of this experiment. If you ask me, I still feel amused to see the result of this experiment when it is performed in real simply because it doesn't appeal to my common sense. The problem is we are thinking in terms of mental images. When we think about something, we try to visualize it in our mind. That's part of our common sense. We think and talk about things which we can feel inside. But there are many serious issues with visualizing things in our mind that way. One of the issues is regarding the inherent limitation in assessing the magnitude of physical quantities beyond a particular range. We are used to the magnitude of physical quantities in a particular range. If it is smaller or larger than those limits, we tend to lose the feel for this. Consider the example of weight. We all have a certain feel about the weight or heaviness of objects. When I ask you what is the weight of an orange, you have a feel inside how much an orange would weigh. But I want you to note the difference between giving a number and feeling it inside. You won't be able to say exactly how many grams an orange would weigh, but you have a feel inside. The same way you have a feel on how would a 20 liter can of water would weigh. And you can also have a feel of the comparison between the weight difference between an orange and a can of water. But do you have a feel about the weight of a bacterium? Well, I can give you the numbers if you want. A bacterial cell is typically around one trillionth of a gram in weight, but can you feel it inside? A bacterial cell is hundreds of times heavier compared to a virus, but can you feel the difference between the masses of a virus and a bacterium? Say I tell you a truck is 20 tons in weight, can you feel how that heaviness is the same way you felt the heaviness of an orange? Now consider numbers. If I say there are five apples to your left side and three apples to your right side, you know a feel of the difference between these two numbers, right? But if I say there are thousand apples on one side and two thousand apples on another side, can you have the feel of that numbers? Both of them are essentially a heap of apples to you right now. Maybe one heap is bigger than the other, but you simply lost the feel for that number. What about time? All of you have a feel about how much time has passed since you started listening to the speech. A few minutes with some reasonable margin of error. But a honeybee flutters its wings 200 times a second. Do you have a feel about the shortness of the time interval between two successive flaps of its wings? What about the difference between 2000 years and 3000 years? You know the difference between the numbers 2000 and 3000 when they are written or told. But I want you to introspect about the difference in the time periods of 2000 and 3000 years. Aren't we just comparing the visual appearance of these numbers when they are written or the auditory feel of these numbers when they are told? Do we actually have the feel of the magnitude of the time involved? To clarify this, let me show you this. What comes to your mind when I say zero? Is it this? 
If it is, just think about it a little bit further. Is this zero or is this really a symbol that represents the idea of zero? This may invoke the concept of zero in your mind, but this is not zero by itself. What about the word nothing? If I ask you to imagine nothing, whatever comes to your mind is not nothing. Because if something comes to your mind, it is something rather than nothing. By now, if you are feeling that I am playing with words, really I am not. Just think about it. Another serious issue is regarding the misconception about the absoluteness of certain quantities. Time, for example, is commonly taken as an absolute quantity. It's always taken for granted that time flows equally for all. When I said 10 seconds, you understand it. There is no ambiguity involved. But it's based on the assumption that the duration of one second for me is exactly equal to the one second of yours. Or in other words, we assume that your clock and my clock tick at the same rate. But it has been proven many times with precision that it is not the case. If you compare a stationary clock with a moving clock, a moving clock will appear to be slower compared to a stationary clock. Of course, the difference may be negligibly small for ordinary relative speeds of motion, but negligible is not zero and the difference is there. It's not just about time intervals. For a moving observer, length and mass are also relative. It's one of the key implications of the theory of relativity in physics. See, it means things which we can have a feel for are actually relative and not absolute. But in nature, there are certain quantities that does not depend on observer, but gives you the same result whenever they are measured. Such quantities are called natural constants or fundamental constants. The speed of light in vacuum may be the most common example. All measurements of the speed of light will give you the same result, irrespective of whether the observer is stationary or moving with light or moving against light. Of course, it's quite counterintuitive. How can something appear to have the same speed when you are moving at it or when you are moving with it? There are many such natural constants like gravitational constants, Planck's constant, etc., which are absolute and will give you the same value whenever they are measured, wherever they are measured and whoever measures it. Most of them have dimensions that cannot be visualized or felt in our mind. You may be able to visualize heaviness, length, distance, time period, brightness, etc. But how would you visualize a quantity that is force multiplied by the square of distance and then divided by the square of time? What kind of a quantity that would be? Well, that is the dimension of gravitational constant, which is a fundamental constant that will give you absolute value for its measurement. See, some things which we think are absolute are really relative. And some other things which are actually absolute are beyond the grasp of our mind. I hope you understand the point I'm trying to drive. To add to this, let's also have a look at our available sources of information. Our primary sense is vision, where we receive information about our surroundings through light. Light is essentially an electromagnetic wave, which is nothing but a parade of oscillating electric and magnetic fields. Depending on the rate of this oscillation, called the frequency, Electromagnetic waves vary in nature. From a wide spectrum of frequencies, from high frequency gamma rays to low frequency radio waves, our eyes can sense only a tiny band of frequencies which are around a few hundred terahertz. And we call those frequencies by the name visible light. The same is the case with sound. Sound is essentially a pressure wave created by vibration of objects. From a wide possibilities of Frequencies of vibration, our ears can detect only a particular band of frequencies from 20 Hz to 20,000 Hz. If it is not in this range, you don't hear anything, even if there is sound. The moral of the story is, the nature doesn't care about how human brain thinks. It has its own ways to work. While discussing quantum physics, theory of relativity, etc., scientists often say that these ideas do not agree with our common sense. Even I say, it in my classrooms. But there is one important point to be added here. Is it mandatory that these mechanisms of nature should agree with our common sense? Who are we? Homo sapiens are one among the 
millions or billions of species of organisms living on the surface of this planet. We think Homo sapiens are special simply because we are the Homo sapiens. We evolved a few hundred thousand years ago on earth with bodily adaptations suitable for surviving in the circumstances of that time. Our circumstances have changed drastically during these years, but our brains haven't. It was too small a time period for biological evolution to make considerable changes on our brains. Or in other words, a caveman of the Paleolithic age were as intelligent as we are today or we are only as intelligent as a caveman from the Paleolithic age, whichever way you want to put it. Of course, we have excellent cognitive capacities compared to other species of living beings, but they are not custom made to comprehend everything. That's what calls for science. With science, we have devised tools to transcend our senses, methods to circumvent the limitations of our own common sense so that we can unravel the secrets of this universe. To see what the sense of science has done to humanity, let's have a look at history. As we said, history of Homo sapiens extends around 200,000 years back, but let us stick on to the history of human civilizations. Invention of agriculture is considered to be the beginning of human civilizations because that was what made us capable of settling down and building up large societies. Evidences tell us that agriculture is not more than 10,000 years old. But even that number is too large for our brains to visualize, as we have discussed earlier. Therefore, let us shrink this history of 10,000 years to one single year. That means in this calendar, humans invented agriculture on the dawn of a January 1st and the present day is close to the midnight of December 31st. Remember, in this special calendar, every day is equal to 27 years in actual history. Now let us try to place some significant inventions or discoveries that change the shape of humanity in this calendar. How would you expect them to look like? This is it. See how crowded those discoveries or inventions are in the last fortnight of this calendar. Electricity, automobiles, computers, x-rays, even the seventh planet in the solar system. Almost every technology which we think are fundamental to humanity now came to existence only in the last minute in this drama. Now, if you look for a reason behind this crowding of events, the answer lies in the history of science. We are able to accomplish feats after the discovery of the method of science. That discovery didn't happen on a single day, but was in fact a collective realization from a long history. In that sense, I would say that the best discovery of humans was the best method to find out truths, which we call the method of science today. So, I vote for the sense of science over common sense. Thank you.